Oh, I look upon Dick as the Tom Brady of, um, of the Kennedy School, as someone who's going to uh, keep on playing at the highest level far longer than uh, anybody else would think of doing. When I think of pop-up, I just think one simple word, curious. He said, look, there are two ways of being successful academically, being a good teacher, being a good scholar, because that's your job, teaching and writing. Everybody understands that when I retire, Richard will still be teaching. During the past 65 years, I have observed and occasionally interacted with many of the outstanding economists of each generation. Richard is one of them. He has a nuanced command of economic theory, a broad knowledge of the real world, and a deep understanding of public policy. He is a rare triple threat. Richard Zeckhauser was born in Philadelphia in 1940, the son of Julius and Estelle Borgenich Zeckhauser. He attended public schools in suburban New York. When he was 11, his aunt taught him to play bridge. He played in his first national championship with his older brother at 14 and went on to win the intercollegiate championship and two national championships four decades apart. Richard's sharp mind landed him at Harvard College, class of 1962, where he expected to study math, but economics won his heart. As a sophomore, he discovered game theory in a course with Thomas Schelling. As a senior, he met Howard Rafa, who introduced him to Bayesian decision theory. He had plans to attend Harvard Business School after graduation, but a summer at the Pentagon, as the most junior of McNamara's whiz kids, changed his mind. On Richard's last day, his economist boss suggested that he pursue a PhD instead. With Schelling's encouragement, two weeks later, he started the economics PhD program at Harvard. While a junior fellow at the Society of Fellows, Richard met and courted Sally Hoover. They were married in 1967 and settled in their home on Irving Street, where they raised two children, Bryn and Ben. Richard's academic career began in 1968 as an assistant professor in Harvard's economics department. He was soon lured by his mentors, Schelling and Rafa, to be a founding member of the Kennedy School. So Dick was one of the pioneers um, in the founding, really, of the Kennedy School. He was a young faculty member at the time. I remember, in his, of course, Howard Rafa was the senior faculty member. I think that they represented all that's great about Harvard. These were extraordinary scholars who really pushed the boundaries and the frontiers of their discipline. But they were not only great scholars, they were people who passionately committed to their students and to teaching. And in, in addition to that, they also wanted to make a difference in the world through their scholarship and through their teaching. They were willing to engage and I think that represents the very best of what Harvard has to offer the world. Well, the Kennedy School, of course, started uh, from nothing because a small group of very distinguished faculty members, senior faculty members who had mostly served in one way or another during the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, uh, came back to Cambridge with a feeling that uh, they could conceive of a way of preparing people for government service that would be important and valuable and uh, very much uh, lacking uh, in the United States. So this group, um, of which I was sort of an adjunct member as dean of the law school uh, from its very beginning, uh, really grew into the nucleus of the, of the faculty. And, and Dick and Graham were perhaps the two earliest recruits as, as uh, junior faculty members uh, and they kind of established uh, the precedent of, of, of hiring really excellent young people. They were the core founding fathers of the Kennedy School and really defined the intellectual, um, if you will, landscape that we were going to cover as students and what was critical for making good public policy in the world. Richard, to me, is, uh, has been, this is going back to quite a few years, uh, but it's been, he's been to me a, a, a kind of symbol or an embodiment of what it was that Derek Bach hoped for uh, when he helped found that Kennedy School. It's hard to imagine 
the Harvard Kennedy School without Richard Zeckhauser? The Kennedy School would exist perhaps without Richard, but it certainly wouldn't exist in its current form. It wouldn't exist as a citadel for the practical application of social science concepts to make the world a better place. I think he makes these really tough concepts really come alive um, in a very real way. So more than any other professor I had, he would link the concepts we were learning to real life situations in a way that felt really, really tangible. He comes and he says, you know, we were supposed to talk about such and such topic, the inventory problem. And I was reading this story in the New York Times and here's this connection and you can see how this problem actually plays out on page one of the newspaper. And it's a connection that somebody else wouldn't have seen. Like he has these things called course maxims, which are, you know, just sort of um, themes of the course that he presents and has us focus on. But at the end of the course, he gave us sort of a list of them for life. And so it was sort of like, you know, yes, we've been doing maybe epidemic modeling, but the same concept might apply to choosing a, a marital partner in the future, you know, whereby you don't have much information and you only make the choice once, so you better, you know, make, make a good one. Richard cares. Richard cares about those students. They're at his house, they're in his mind, uh, they're in his heart, and they know it, and they appreciate it, and they should, because the opportunity to study with Richard Zeckhauser is a real privilege. Probably one of the first students that uh, Dick Zeckhauser ever had. And to be honest with you, Richard has been one of the most important uh, people in my life. Dick was an amazing professor. He had the shortest mean waiting time between interesting ideas of, I think, anybody I've ever known. Thank you for having been a good friend for nearly 40 years. It's been that long since I attended your class on analytic frameworks for policy. It made a lasting impression on me and on many more Singapore students who did the same course over the years. We've often found the ideas useful, dealing with public policy issues of all kinds. His analytic methods course is the hardest course at the Kennedy School for a reason because it's designed to push you beyond what you think are your limitations in being able to learn and apply analytic techniques to public policy problems. And people go into that class not knowing if they can do it, questioning themselves, wondering if they, they you know, almost, almost with the survivor mentality of, am I even gonna survive this experience? Can I even do this math? And when you come out the other side, you have an experience of this is this has transformed your life. This has shown you that you are able to do things that you didn't even know you can do. More broadly, has trained so many people, either directly who are his students or indirectly as people that he mentored like me, uh, and sent them out into the world to make better decisions and to create better institutions and to make changes that make us all better off as a society. Ever since I was really little, he has always willingly helped me with my math homework. So he creates word problems with our passions in them. And for instance, this fall when I was learning about systems of equations, he created a problem about different speeds of running because I run cross country. You know how a child's always marveled at the world? And he's always like, oh, you know? And there's something about Richard that's like that in some sense in the classroom. That combination of just brilliance um, and, you know, tremendous scholarly achievement with this kind of impish sense of humor, this, play, this playfulness uh, is just really rare. So it's, of course, not a surprise to me that his students remember him for 20, 30, 40 years after they've graduated. I mean, he's sort of the opposite of being a, a tightly focused, you know, monomaniacal scholar. He's an omnivorous consumer of ideas who never forgets that if research isn't joyful, it's lost a central purpose. There's no one I know who has more sharp thoughts on more subjects than Richard Zeckhauser. You can see it in the breadth of his uh, publications. He has articles forthcoming on Raphael paintings, on the geopolitics of deterring uh, terrorism, on uh, 
bank uh, renegotiation, on stock price reactions to uh, President Trump's election, and many more subjects. And that's all within uh, the last uh, year. Richard has one of the fastest computers in his head that, that I've ever seen, and he would so the way we would write something together, it would be theoretical. He'd tell me what the structure was, um, and then he told me uh, what the conclusions, what the properties of uh, the model would be when we got out the other end, um, something I couldn't possibly tell. So, And my job was to write the model and see if his prediction about what the properties of this system would be, and without fail, he was always right. He's the only person that I know that could write a paper in his head. Brilliant. It's true. We wrote an article once, years and years ago, perhaps 40 years ago, on the regulation of genetic engineering. And in that article, we pointed out that genetic engineering, contrary to popular belief, is not likely to be put to work to produce mosquito man, half a mosquito and half a man. So I'm surprised that that article has not been seen as the foundation, which it clearly was. Are there mosquito men around? Certainly not. So thank you, Richard. <laughs> In 2008, Richard and I wrote a book together entitled The Patron's Payoff, Conspicuous Commissions in Italian Renaissance Art. But when we first met about 20 years ago, I knew nothing about economics, and he knew nothing about art history or the Renaissance. In my career, this has been the most satisfying, intellectually stimulating collaboration I've ever had and certainly the most fun. His instincts surpass anyone's I've ever met. Kind of endlessly smart about everything. So I've had great conversations with Richard about Middle Eastern politics, American politics, uh, social relations, uh, you know, early American history, uh, the Quran, the Bible. I mean, he's just one of these very wide ranging intellects who, ha you know, approaches everything with a kind of open mind and a fascination. All of this bespeaks his willingness, his desire to leap across fields and to draw insights from other areas. Now, he does this not just by reading the literature, but by having lunch with people, by inviting them to the, to the Howell's house to drink two buck chuck or whatever it was that Richard had decided was the right you know, value per dollar in terms of the wine purchases. Um, and it's those connections which he, you know, in some sense personified that, that stands at the heart of what he is and starts at the heart of what makes great universities work because they're not about isolated scholars. They're about scholars who constantly learn from one another. When I was a tenure track faculty member, I came back to my office one day and found a slip of paper pushed under the office door. It said, RJZ's Prescriptions for Happiness. Consider optimism. Eliminate envy, eliminate regret, collect information favorable to a decision, make pleasure-enhancing decisions long in advance to increase utilities of anticipation, focus on lots of details, each will give you some pleasure. And I must say, I return to this piece of paper on a regular basis, and it is, with every passing year, more and more right. Thank you, Richard. You know, there's no such thing as a former protege for Richard. You know, sort of once in his orbit, always in his orbit. And he has spread out across the country, across the world, across the decades, uh, a vast number of people who are connected to each other because they were connected with him. Well, if you look at the number of people that Richard has collaborated with, and the quality of the papers that he's written with those individuals and the number of disciplines that they cut across, I think it's hard to find anybody that would have that breadth of, of, of contribution at the university. Richard is a super scholar and teacher. Also, he is just a wonderful husband, partner, father, and grandfather. Happy 50th anniversary. Happy 50th. <laughs> I love you. 
and I thank you for so many wonderful conversations and so much wisdom and advice. I'm eternally grateful. Richard, uh, from the bottom of my heart, I wish you uh, the happiest of 50th anniversaries. Congratulations, Pop-Pop. You are one of the best and sweetest grandfathers ever. Um, you've taught both of us so much. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Pop-Pop. I love you so much. Thank you so much for everything that you've done for me. You have changed my life and taught me so many incredible things. So congratulations, uh, Dick, after 50 years of splendid uh, accomplishment. Richard, you don't know how much a part of my life you've been, and I appreciate that. I hope the next 50 years are as interesting and rewarding for you um, and your students as the last 50 years. Um, I just want to say thank you, because I think he's um, inspired uh, generations of students at the Kinney School. Um, in their professional lives, but also in how they relate to the world. Um, um, uh, what they do, even in terms of work, in terms of passion. Happy 50th anniversary, Richard. It's been a pleasure to know you all these years. I've learned a lot. And so, my friend, uh, uh, we'll have another many, many more. Keep going. He publishes. If publish or perish were true, Richard would live forever. 13 books, over 300 papers, and other publications. In baseball nowadays, hitters are often evaluated by combining their on-base average with their slugging percentage. For academics, we would combine teaching and publishing. On that metric, there are very few economists who can match Richard's 50 years at Kennedy. I love you, Rich, and congratulations.